have our Executive Outlook. On our Executive Outlook today, we will be joined by three impressive multifamily executives and our moderator, L.D. Salmonson, the CEO of Cherry. LD is joined by Joanna Zabriskie, President and CEO of BH Management, Jonathan Morgan, President of Morgan Properties JV, and Gregory Bates, CEO of GID. Please join me in welcoming our Executive Outlook to the stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, really happy to have you all join us here today. I have uh, some really great panelists and uh, looking forward to really having a fun conversation. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, LD Salmon is one of the founders of Cherry, a real estate data management platform. We help the largest investors, banks, insurance companies connect all their disparate data to a single source of truth um, to enable better investment, underwriting, and management decisions. I have with me today three awesome people, Greg Bates, CEO of GID, uh, Joanna Zabriskie, President and CEO of BH Management, and Jonathan Morgan, President of Morgan Property. So I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves in a second. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Greg, uh, how about you kick us off? Sure. How are you? I'm Greg Bates with GID. We are a national owner and operator uh, and developer uh, of Class A and Class B apartments across the United States. We uh, own and manage about 40,000 units today. Excellent. Uh, Joanna? Hi, Joanna Zabriskie, President and CEO of BH Companies. We're an owner operator with just over 100,000 units in 26 states. Excellent, and Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan Morgan from Morgan Properties. We own and manage about 90,000 units and are the largest private owner in the country and the second largest in the nation. We're based in King of Prussia and we're in 20 states currently. Excellent, so really excited to this one. Um, let's kick it off with kind of a, a big loaded one. So. Um, in many ways, this has been uh, the year of technology or maybe the last 18 months of technology for the industry and things that, that took years to kind of develop uh, really accelerate over last year. And that means uh, basically all largest players such as yourself have been investing a lot in operational and financial efficiencies. And, and most of you are also investing in core infrastructure. So let's kick it off there. What, what has your firm done over the last 18 months to adopt technology? And, and really, what does this mean for the competitive landscape? Do, do some of these smaller owner operators stand a chance in this new world? Uh, Greg, how about you kick us off? Sure. So I guess at a high level, uh, you know, we're believers that scale matters because the multifamily industry is changing. So we look out at other asset classes, the equities market, the bond market. And when you think about real estate, it's transitioning from an alternative asset class to a mainstream asset class. And you're seeing these large players emerge, as you just referenced. And so when you look at those other asset types in the equities or bond market, you see PIMCO, BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanguard, those groups have found a way to provide terrific service at very thin fees. And so I think that competitive pressure is coming our way. So when we look at the space today, and you just heard from the other two panelists how big their portfolios are, scale matters and operating efficiency matters. The technology investments that are being made by the large owners and operators in the multifamily space today are tremendous. So if you're a small player or regional group, you have to embrace technology, I think, in order to survive and flourish and to be competitive with what some of these large players are doing. So I think technology is going to change not just the resident experience, but also our employee experiences as we try to make sure our employees are not organizing data, but analyzing and evaluating data and making their jobs kind of more satisfying. So I, I think a big transformation is coming and tech is going to play a fairly significant role. I definitely, we're definitely going to come back to that data question in a second. Uh, Joanna, what are you doing over at BH? I agree with Greg 100% that if you think about the capital that has hit our industry in the last three to four years, and especially right now, we're seeing real institutional capital inflows and that capital expects data today. They, they want real time information. It's not you know like hurry up and wait for your accounting package that's 20 days old by the time you get the information. We wanna know and understand trends that happened you know this morning. And so we've spent a lot of time uh, at, at BH in you know, really understanding our data. We have a group of data scientists in, in uh, Dallas that work for BH and are responsible for our data and visualizing that data. So we pull data in from all of our operating systems, all the SaaS software that's held out there. 
Uh, and then we turn around and visualize it in a series of dashboards that we've created that we think mirror the KPIs that we wanna see, whether it be operational or financial. And that's really important. It, it, this widespread access to data within our organization means that we are not chasing Excel spreadsheets or trying to find the exceptions. We're really understanding what's happening on our properties and, and better able to make decisions in real time that make tomorrow's operations better. So that's been a big focus of ours. And I think um, big, bigger players are going to be more nimble in, which is ironic, right? But more able, more nimble in developing uh, data platforms to operate better. Oh, that's great. Jonathan, what are you guys doing? So what I would say is that um, technology is in real estate, if you think about the business model, it's very traditional, it's old school, you know, the sticks and bricks about real estate. Technology is a way in some ways to modernize this business and take us into the future. So Morgan Properties, you know, we are pr predominantly in workforce housing and the buildings that we're buying are the apartment communities aren't necessarily sexy, but the returns are. I'd say technology is another opportunity there. So technology is sexy right now in terms of where we are in the industry. Everyone's looking at it as a value add opportunity, whether that be on the revenue side to make it a creator for your investments or on, on the uh, operational side, you know, in terms of operations to reduce your controllable operating expenses and to get better. So I do think that we're looking at a, an opportunity here where some of the larger players with the infrastructure and the talent already on board are gonna have a leg up on the competition. That being said, I do think it could be an opportunity for some of the smaller players to leverage off technology and to improve and try to level the playing field too. So in terms of this, this past year, it's been really focusing on how do we get better as an organization? We're obviously getting bigger. Now, how do we, how do we become better and improve? And I'd say that leveraging off of virtual leasing was the, the big opportunity that we wanted to capitalize in a post-COVID world. So help me understand the financing of some of these uh, technology plays, right? So when we build a new uh, property, you know, we'll hopefully have a line item for some of these, you know, new technologies put in place in the buildings. And maybe there's some operational efficiencies from, you know, that offset manpower kind of the corporate level. But um, for those buildings that we already have up in place and we really, you know, retrofitting is the kind of thought process there or places where um, we don't really have a line item for, for these types of things. How does this fit in the budget? How do we get these things, you know, passed across the executive teams? How do we get these, these, these not meaning, you know, not small investments, these are very meaningful investments. How do we get them across the finish line? Maybe Joanna, we can take it off with you. I think we've been really successful at doing that. We've got over 20,000 units right now that have some type of smart home technology in them for our residents. And that enables us to operate the, our buildings a little bit more efficiently as well. Um, it's all about ROI and really showing that there is a financial or operational ROI for the installation of these assets and then, and then keeping us from being obsolete, right? If, if Jonathan is out there putting in great technology packages all around our assets, um, residents are going to vote with their feet and they're going to walk over and say, hey, you know, I can get um, a smart home here at this asset and I can't get it over here. Um, they're going to they're going to really decide, especially with the, the savvier um, Gen Zers coming up, they're going to decide where they want to um, rent based on the technology in those assets. Now, Jonathan, what does that mean uh, in your organization? <clears throat> So I, I think that everyone's understanding, you know, everyone's looking at where is the puck going and technology is really going to get us there. And so I think that it's not that we're reinventing the wheel, but we, we see that there's, a, there's certainly a trend that's going to be permanent. And I think it's an opportunity and it's an opportunity for every organization to leverage off of technology and to get better. And, you know, if you look at our investment strategy, we're really focused on geographic concentration, economies of scale. And that's really what technology could bring in a lot of ways. So we feel it's a way to to improve and, and I think that also the, the consideration is, you know, knowledge is power and everyone wants information immediately in this environment. And I think having that ability to leverage off technology to become more knowledgeable and be more proactive is a real opportunity. Rick, how about you? Uh, so <clears throat> I would agree with both of those things. I think for new development, a lot of the smart home technology, et cetera, is very easy to justify. The retrofits on older properties have been more challenging. <clears throat> we actually, about three years ago, hit pause on trying to retrofit uh, our buildings with smart home technology. We are very earnestly right now reevaluating that, and we're doing so 
one, because the, the hardware's improved, the software's improved. They now have data to share on, and so do we with our pilots. Uh, so I would agree with Joanna that that now all of a sudden is a little easier business decision. Um, but in terms of what we're focused on, I'm going to mention that so Jonathan said the word sexy or hip or cool for what's happening today. Those are more fun things to talk about. I'll tell you, we've been very focused on some things that are a little bit yesterday's news, the proven technologies maybe that are a decade old. So our business right now, in every aspect of our business, is focused on mapping processes and simplifying processes. Once we really understand those processes, that's when you get into process automation and you can really use technology, but you gotta have a great process first. And then you can, after you automate, you can think about outsourcing or centralizing. Everything flows though from that process work. And I mention it on this call because my experience in, in my last two or three shops in the real estate industry is that the technology teams and, and the operations teams in the field, but largely at the corporate level, technology is actually where the project management expertise resides. And those departments are critical to trying to help the business transform to get the processes simplified and mapped and then automated. So it, it's not cool to talk about, but a ton of our investment is going in there and, and then candidly going into systems integration, because when we find the new tools we love, they all have to work together seamlessly. And that is not an easy task. Uh, and there are lots of trade-offs to be made on that, I think is all the technology departments struggle with. So, Joanna, you mentioned um, kind of the, or maybe Jonathan mentioned the puck moving, but you mentioned maybe if there's a, a building that Jonathan builds near you with a certain technology on board, and you, you kind of have to, to catch up there. What is the expectation of, of the majority of kind of new renters uh, within those buildings? Are they expecting smart homes? Are they expecting smart locks? Is that a gimmick, which is kind of nice to have, or is that actually driving rent prices or, or driving decisions to adopt um, um, certain buildings versus others? I think it's certainly, it's absolutely driving decisions on where to rent and it's driving economics as well, because people will pay more for a smart home enabled apartment. And uh, we, we've seen that across our portfolio. We have no problem convincing a resident that this is a superior product. If you have a smart lock, a thermostat, it's all talking, it's hub-based, Z-Wave-based, uh, that's a real upside, especially in some of the Class B assets that we manage. Now, as Greg said, there are challenges to retrofitting some of the B assets. You, you have surprises that you wouldn't find as a new developer and putting in packages. So it, it's not without... Um, some, some operational or, you know, our construction teams are in there really trying to understand um, before we snip wires, what's going to happen next. And you don't always know. <laughs> and Jonathan, is that the same in workforce uh, housing or, or is there maybe a little more leniency there on what you need to put in the buildings? Yeah, I'd say it really depends market by market and, you know, building by building in some ways. But the only way to be a class A owner of class B apartments is if you have class A technology. And I think that, you know, setting yourself up for success for the long haul is how we look at it. So I think that it's, it is a lot of infrastructure, making sure you have the right softwares and systems that's, you know, to be expected. But then going forward in terms of some of the opportunities like the value add and the smart apartments and what have you, I think that it, we are looking at that in some ways like the new backsplash opportunity. And so it is ROI driven, but it's also because you want resident retention and you want your residents to, you know, to be there for the long haul. So I think it's more this long-term approach of, you know, in this environment, residents have so many different choices and so many options out there that you really want to make it appealing and palatable to them to make sure that they can, you know, stay with you and continue to grow with your community for, for the long term. And it's not just the residents, right? It's it, We're doing that for our team members as well. Um, technology is just as important for them to uh, give great service to our residents and having smart home or smart um, phones in every single maintenance team member's hands is, is critical and doing the, the mobile work orders and being able to chat via an app with our residents so they know that we're, they're being taken care of even if we're not there right away. Um, that's been a, a critical piece. So it's not just outward facing, but it's the internal teams as well, being able to communicate with one another in the residence through technology. 
leveraging awesome. off of everyone's strengths and, and technology yeah. as well. And I think that that's really important. And you want to make everyone motivated knowing that they, it's not that technology is going to replace jobs. So it's, it's a way for us to become even more productive. Hey, Greg, so given that, uh, can you afford not to retrofit those buildings you put a halt on? So we are evaluating it. I do think there is a payback now. We have looked, um, it's interesting, Joanna talks a lot about the resident facing demand. We took a step back and said, okay, I, I do agree with all that. What if we don't get a rent pop? Um, what if we're focusing on operational efficiencies, et cetera? We made an investment early on in smart rent through real estate technology ventures. And they are doing some things on the operational side, which are great, right? Their leak detection uh, is great, especially in the older B properties. They have a parking availability uh, function now, which is great to kind of maximize parking and charge for parking. So there are a lot of other things that some of these smart home providers are offering today. It makes the value proposition a bit easier. Um, I would tell you though, we have been very focused when we think about the resident, my big initiative is their first experience with us. When they're doing research as a prospect and then their first experience leasing with us. And a lot of our money, leasing came up before, but the leasing process really was unchanged for 30 years in the apartment space. It's changing dramatically now. And you see it everywhere in other industries, right? You can go to a grocery store and watch people stand in a longer line for the self-service checkout than to actually have someone check them out. So see the same thing in Home Depot, right? It just, customer self-service is a huge theme. And that rolls through everything on the research side, the uh, leasing side with self-guided uh, tours, it's just a, a huge first impression that I think we're focused on. And when we look at people on the prospect side, when you compare the hours our leasing office is open versus the hours a lot of people want a tour, which tend to be before their job starts or after it ends, there's a disconnect there. And things like self-guided tours, which are enabled and facilitated obviously by the smart home and smart lock technology, really make that experience night and day better and, and chatbots do the same. So we've invested a lot in upgrading all of our websites and introducing either meet a lease or better bot, you know, so there are a lot of those technologies we've rolled out and it's totally changed the experience. If you're going out to lease an apartment, uh, just markedly, markedly better customer experience, I think. Save me a shout out to meet a lease there, perfect. <laughs> um, let's uh, switch gears um, towards data and, and you all kind of spoke about data in, in different contexts and I, I want to put it in maybe a slightly different context and um, the, the Gartner analytics continuum kind of speaks of this transition from declarative analytics, what happened, descriptive analytics, why it happened, predictive analytics, you know, what might happen in the future and then maybe prescriptive analytics down the road, you know, how do we actuate or, or create certain realities. Uh, maybe Greg kick us off, where are you in that process? Um, and where do you hope to be maybe um, within the next 18 months? So about two years ago, I started talking with our teams about little data versus big data, because we were having all these really cool conversations about how predictive analytics could change the world and our access to amazing data through cell phone providers, et cetera. And I, I really, I know I'm the boring one on the panel that keeps going back to, you know, real baseline technologies, but we set up a business intelligence team to make sure that, you know, we were pulling all of our data from one system. We had a single source of the truth and everything was well integrated. So COVID uh, really gave us a chance to invest an awful lot in that. Our investors, as you could imagine, wanted real-time operating data so we have dashboards for everyone in the company with all of our real-time operating performance. It has proven to be hugely helpful. Uh, and that, I think, just trying to take operating data, make sure it's tied in perfectly to LRO or YieldStar, whatever you use, uh, and then taking all of that data and leveraging that in your you know, buy, sell analyses and your new underwriting has been really transformative for us. We, we actually now, I think, have a platform that's fairly integrated 
where everyone has access to all that data. And we're just making better decisions faster because we're not organizing data. We're trying to validate the data we're using is correct. We've got it at our fingertips and we can make decisions quickly. So that part for us has been a tremendous transformation. Oh, that's excellent. And Joanne, I know you, you have a data science team now in-house. Uh, where are they in that process? Very similar to what Greg said. We spent a lot of time uh, pre-COVID and it's been nice to be on a panel and we really don't talk about COVID that much. Uh, <laughs> um, we spent a lot of time pre-COVID um, verifying data and making sure we had a single source of truth so that we could see um, our data was messy. I mean, if you think about a property management and who's entering that data, and if you have 350 properties with you know two leasing agents at each one and they're putting in all these new residents moving in, there's a lot of um, margin for error there. So we cleaned up our workflows, we cleaned up the data entry process, um, and we have this big, this big server now with 20 years of data that we're able to look back on and then look forward and make some, some predictions. Um, we're not there 100%, but we're getting towards predictive, um, but we're very accurate in what we have. And now during COVID, during the heat of you know, the summer last year, when we were all wondering when people were gonna pay us, um, we would update some of our payment dashboards three, four times a day. And so we could understand exactly, you know, what our payments were coming in and, and started understanding that we were entering into a new part of our business, which is people, residents were not going to pay in the first five days. So when were we going to get payments and, and make some decisions about upcoming months and payment plans and all of that. So our data was crucial um, and the visibility and access to that data was crucial for us getting through COVID and making great operating systems and decisions. And, and that's just carrying forward. I mean, that COVID kicked us all in the, you know what, in terms of the virtual leasing and, and really accelerating some adapt, adaption of the technologies that we were all dabbling around in. And now they're part of our systems. So it's been an interesting, rather rapid journey uh, I think Jonathan said it earlier, you know, multifamily is, is a little bit more stodgy and, and not so tech enabled. And we really had an awakening over the last 18 months. Jonathan, where are you on the journey? Yeah, I think that BI, I, I would echo the comments. So BI obviously is a, is a game changer. And, you know, when you have 300 plus communities and you can't be in all these different locations and you want to be proactive, it's good to have information. I think that you're seeing this trend where operations is it's always a people business and that's going to continue forever but it's becoming a lot more analytical where you need to know how you're doing at all times it's not just looking at what is the negative variance but understanding the why of how why aren't we hitting what we should be hitting and where do we see the opportunity and how do we get there and i think it's really been uh, impactful for us just in terms of giving us the confidence to say in this uh, post-covid environment we have all this information at our disposal so we can really have the conviction to say hey we're going to pursue this opportunity so what I would say is that, you know, when COVID happened, we were one of the only groups that was really actively growing. And we, you know, we closed on a 3,200 unit portfolio in the Carolinas in April of 2020 at a time when it was a falling knife and no one would go near any of these opportunities. And that was really having that conviction and knowing that we had a presence in the market, we had the data that supported it. And then we followed that with another large acquisition of about 14,000 units in 10 states. And that was challenging to do due diligence in this environment, but because we had already acquired this prior portfolio, we, we understood what that looked like and leveraged off, to, of, off of uh, technology in terms of doing virtual diligence and being as hands-on as we could be. So I do think that that's really where we're going and it's understanding where do we want to leverage off of technology and how do we get better as an organization while continuing to do all the things that we do really well. Yeah, so, so as you all know, when we deploy Cherry, you know, typically, you know, there's this kind of aura around machine learning and AI and all these kind of fancy buzzwords. And at the end of the day, when we deploy, the questions become, what do I own? Where do I own it? Um, what's my financial performance look like versus budget? You know, the variance analysis, what do I look like versus my benchmarks versus my peers? What does operational performance look like? And, and as you all just point out, these things are not trivial, right? Th these are things that actually allow us to be able to um, to benchmark our businesses to perform better um, and really outperform our peers. And that brings me kind of the other side of the equation, um, the side of the investors, the LPs, um, different types of, of investors, kind of a, both you know, public and private markets. Um, what do they expect these days, right? So back in the day, it was really, really hard to benchmark funds. Um, and now obviously they're getting a lot smarter about it. What are they expecting from a technology standpoint, both from what do they expect from a reporting and what do they expect you to deploy within your portfolios? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Greg. 
Uh, <clears throat> so it's a great question. We have some very large uh, U.S. pension funds, foreign sovereign wealth funds uh, as investors. Uh, look, I would tell you a couple of things. They're expecting us to make prudent decisions when it comes to technology, right? They certainly read about all the cool new technologies, but they're not pushing us to roll them out. They're pushing us to evaluate them and be prudent with their capital to make sure there's a real payback to it. There, there are a couple of big things they expect just as a baseline, though. One is incredibly uh, accurate, real-time data. When they call us with a question, we give them answers within hours uh, on everything they request. And I think that real-time operating data is a key baseline. Uh, I do agree. I think ESG has become a very big theme. And so we are talking to them an awful lot about what we're doing to try and reduce our carbon footprint. It can be smart irrigation or energy efficiency, solar, any of those items. But we are very focused on the payback on those. So it's not really green for green sake. It's really taking a step back and figuring out where to best deploy the capital for those things. And then I think the other item is just uh, operating expenses, efficiencies. Uh, you know, as we grow with folks, fee pressure just is a theme that you can't escape with investors. Uh, I think that's uh, kind of toning down a little bit at the moment because everyone has capital they can't deploy. I think they're now maybe a little less focused on fees and a little more focused on performance, who has access to product, who can drive return. But those things were huge, you know, real-time operating data, ESG, and then making sure that we're operating as efficiently as everyone else in the market. And it's pretty transparent for people to see these things. There's an index to track virtually everything now. They get a really good sense of how you stack up against the competition. There's no real place to hide anymore. Absolutely. Jonathan, what are you seeing? Well, I think that in this environment, you know, you're, you're finding there's a lot of capital on the sidelines. There's, there's limited opportunities, but also you're, you're dealing with investors, institutional investors that are extremely sophisticated, that really would like to see real time information about how you're doing, how are we performing, are we hitting, you know, our pro forma and, and where are we in the process? So I think it's a huge opportunity for someone who, you know, for, for us, just as an example, as an owner operator, now that you have all this information with BI, you have the ability to provide it to your investors directly so they can have real time information, have an understanding of how you're doing. And for a while it was always, well, this is a proven business model because we have the asset down the street and we're generating these premiums and this is all the stuff that we can do and it's great. And that is that is definitely good for a boat of confidence, but now to leverage off technology, have the data at your disposal, that really goes a long way. And it's in markets that you're, you know, if you, if you have questions about rent growth or questions about, are we able to hit pro forma, you actually have the ability to show your track record and show how you're doing. And I think for investors, that goes a long way since it really depends on how long you're planning to hold it, what the term is. And, you know, for us, we're always looking ahead, trying to keep everyone happy. And the name of the game is to, you know, undersell over deliver. And I think that by leveraging off of BI, you're in a position to do so. So are you sharing those dashboards with your investors directly at this point? We are. We share them with investors, not, not with all of our investors, but it's something that we typically like to provide and be proactive in the event that they aren't as interested. We don't send to every investor, but it's a great, uh, great way to really, you know, keep them in the mix and make sure you're making informed decisions together. Yeah, it used to be that we were afraid to show our, our LPs uh, some of this information. They were proud of it because that's what differentiates us. Um, Joanna, what are you seeing? I think this past year, uh, the most important thing that we did with our investors is we communicated early and often. And early on in the pandemic, right, there was preservation of capital concerns. Everybody flashed back to the great financial crisis. And there was a lot of, a lot of concern um, with our investor base. And as we move through it, the transparency of our data, and we do share um, our dashboards uh, with any investor who is interested, but like Jonathan said, some of them don't want to do a deep dive or aren't interested, but for those that are, it's there, it's accessible, There's, it's very transparent. And, and that was critical. We were able to talk about operations. Uh, we were able to talk about financial performance and, and give the visuals behind that, uh, which led our investor base to be much more comfortable throughout um, a really tough time of uncertainty. So you mentioned uh, the Great Recession. And, and one of the most interesting things that I think came out of the Great Recession is the emergence 
um, of this new asset class that you know it sort of existed, but not to the same degree, which is single family rentals, SFRs. And I know some of you, we've talked about this, some of you are in the space and some of you um, are not, but it's clearly a stalking horse to kind of the multifamily industry. I think uh, roughly 15 uh, billion properties already in the market, um, roughly the same amount coming in over the next five to 10 years. We're talking about 97, 98% occupancies for 25 year old stock. Um, really a, a major asset class that we can't ignore. It's also typically not in these kind of, you know, major cities or major MSAs. It's usually right outside of that. So maybe Joanna, uh, we'll start with you. Um, uh, what are you seeing in the space? Is this something that, that you're getting interested in and, um, and why and how does this kind of interact with your multifamily portfolio? So I think it's a natural extension of housing, right? Um, people are buying homes still at a later uh, a later age, there um, people are, are putting off having children. Um, women are having children at a much later age, and and so the transitory nature of our workforce is that they don't want to own a home as early as they did. So I think that I don't think it's going to necessarily impact our multifamily assets as they stand now. It's going to elongate the the renter curve, if you will. Um, people are going to rent later on in life and maybe put off that home bu buying decision. Um, well into their 30s. And so um, as people graduate from, if you will, you know, the, the multifamily assets that, that the three of us manage here, they're going to want a yard, they're going to want more space, uh, a suburban lifestyle. Uh, you know, they've got a mortgage already, it's a student loan. And so uh, I don't see it really necessarily impacting our space. I, I see it extending the rental space throughout it. And we're very interested in managing in that space as it as you know assets or communities um, come up around where we have geographic footprints. I think it makes a lot of sense because we use the same technology, the same leasing life cycle, et cetera. So I, I think it's an interesting, a lot of capital there, right? So it's gonna grow quickly and it's an interesting space to watch. Yeah, I, I believe roughly 10% of all new properties are built for rent and given the wood shortage, timber shortage more broadly, those are the ones that are actually being built right now. So it's probably a, a bigger number when we think about what actually is coming on the market mm -hmm. for the next few years. Um, Jonathan, I don't believe you're in uh, in the SFR space, but uh, clearly it's affecting the markets you're in. What are you seeing there? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I saw a stat that said that in, uh, if you were to compare baby boomers in 1990, uh, the, the average, the median age is 35 years old and they owned a third of all residential real estate. And you compare that to today, the average age of millennials is 31, and they own less than 3% of all residential real estate, which is pretty astounding when you think about that stat for a second. And I know we're not talking about, you know, um, the American dream and the white picket fences anymore. I do think the suburbs are just as hot as, as ever, but I, I think that in general, it is a dream deferred a bit. You have millennials that it's renter nation, you have so many different options, so many different opportunities. You've, you've now been through two major recessions in a short period of time. So I think the millennials are putting off some of the life events like marriage, as Joanna alluded to, and having a family. And I think that that's really changing a bit. And you're not really building new workforce housing as, as often. If you're going to be given the cost of uh, the, the cost today of lumber and everything, you're going to be building class A typically. So the stock is really not as much of an issue, but it is something we're mindful of. So every time we, we buy, we're, we're focused on what's our basis. And we have to buy it typically 50 to 60% of replacement cost, And it could be, you know, upwards of 70% in the Southeast, depending on vintage. And that's something that we're very mindful of. And then what is the spread differential between class A and B rents, just to make sure that the value proposition going in, um, you can support. And I think that that's really important to consider. Greg, what are your thoughts? So I, I actually think Joanna and Jonathan covered it perfectly. Uh, I participated in this space in, in my old company and we bought and renovated 7,300 single family homes. Uh, I think Joanna said it perfectly. It's an elongation of the rental cycle. Uh, I don't view it as a direct uh, massive threat to what we do in the multifamily sector. We keep an eye on it. We pay attention to it. We don't plan to enter the sector, uh, <clears throat> but I do think it's a long-term, extremely viable business model. And if you're an institutional investor, I do think it's worthy of consideration. Uh, you know, for us, it's a little too different from our core business model. And we're a very, very focused company on the handful of things we think we do exceptionally well. So it's not a fit for us. 
Uh, but I think it's worthy of looking uh, if you're an institutional investor. And I also was amazed years ago by all of the technology that was employed in trying to figure out how to manage scattered site homes uh, in a way that you're seeing now transition into the multifamily industry. A lot of these technologies we find cool were started as a result of SFR. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think when we think about, you know, obviously the, the millennials are now turning 40, right? So um, when I think about the, the, the newer kind of Gen Z uh, experience oriented um, folks, and, and we hear about all these models like, you know, rent as a service or living as a service is potentially kind of the, the filler for the next uh, few years. And that really bodes well for both multifamily and single family rental stock, because at the end of the day, the more we optimize and more we put on, more we optimize for kind of these experiences, the more we put off these these decisions to actually purchase to the extent that we're going to purchase in the future. Um, I think that really um, will affect the market as well. Um, I want to wrap up with kind of um, um, looking into the future, right? So we, we've learned a lot over the last 18 months, uh, massive acceleration um, and adoption in pretty much everything. And, and some of the technologies that we see today are clearly going to carry into the future um, for the long run, especially things around data that we discuss are clearly going to be the backbone of performance. Some things maybe not as much, um, but starting with you, Greg, maybe, what is the one thing that you would think is the most impactful technology that you deployed over the last 18 months that will really make the biggest difference into the future? Well, we've talked a lot about it. Uh, it, it would certainly be the leasing process and the self-guided tours. Um, but maybe I'll give you one other thing to think about. I do believe as you look out in this industry, people have coined the phrase, the hotelization of the office industry or the apartment industry. I do believe the communities that we establish, the services we provide, the changing amenities that matter. And I remember our chief technology officer telling me, you guys always talk about amenities and you miss it. Technology is the amenity that your residents care about. So all the other stuff you guys think is really cool in your clubhouses, text the baseline for everything. But I do think that that hotelization of our sector and a lot of the services that we're now being asked to provide and that people expect now as a baseline are really different. I, I mean, to me, when I think about hotelization, I always think about that hug when you walk into the building. Um, to me, that also always has to balance with, you know, some people want that hug and some people just want, let me go show the, you know, let me show myself the property. I don't need you in this process. If I need a hug, I'll call you, right? That's kind of that, the new hotel kind of hybrid model. Well, think about, you know, when we go on vacation, we think about spending a fair amount of money on a vacation based on a website and reviews. And so, you, you know, you think about that and how well they do that when you look at the different resorts or hotel companies, you know, that experience is there and available for all of us to provide when people are evaluating apartments. Uh, Jonathan, what, what's going to be the biggest differentiator that you see over the, the near future? Well, I think you, you mentioned a lot of good points. You know, we're going from selling a product to selling a service, and now everything is experiential in terms of what you want to do to attract your, your future residents going forward. I think that right now you're seeing a lot of the VC companies are taking the lead. So you have the fifth walls of the world. They're out there raising SPACs and, you know, have a lot of capital behind them as a first mover. And uh, I think that that's going to change. I think that one of the things we're seeing is, you know, we're, we're really the end user in a lot of ways of a lot of the systems, a lot of the products that come out. Uh, we have of the 90,000 units, about 40,000 that are wholly owned without partners. And we use this in a lot of ways internally for our innovation team to really test out the softwares, figure out what makes sense for the business. And I think that's going to continue. And what we're going to find is that there's going to be a tremendous opportunity where operators are going to come forward and say, these are all the different areas that we'd love to have you invest and have you focus on that really is untapped potential. And I think that that's how it's gonna transform. And right now, I think that it's a moment in time where everyone's just thinking about the bottom line, but I think that there's other opportunities that we're not thinking about right now because we have a captive audience and the fundamentals are strong, but you have to assume it won't be here forever. So how are there ways to continue to get better and move the ball downfield? Yeah, absolutely. Joanna, what do you think is to be the most impactful technology over the next 18, 24 months? Well, we've talked about a lot of them. Data and technology are cru crucial uh, to our business, but even more crucial are, are people. And we've thrown a lot of data and technology at our onsite teams, and it's pretty complicated out there and add a pandemic on top of that. So 
I think what's going to be critical is, you know, keeping our culture sane through all of this and, and centralizing some of the things that the onsite teams don't need to do, whether they be pandemic plan or payment plans or, or evictions or some of the more, um, you know, tough or time consuming administrative tasks and really focusing on, on back to what Greg said, sales and service for our residents and then support for our onsite teams. I think that's gonna be a big piece of what we're focusing on going forward. Tying all of this together with a bow and making it a great experience for the people who work for us as well as the ones that live in our assets. This has been awesome. So I'm really excited for all the people who get to live in all your properties in your future. Sounds like they're gonna have a really good time. So uh, Joanna, Jonathan, Greg, uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, this has been a lot of fun and really looking forward to seeing you all continue to grow and explode over the next few years. And both adoption and, um, and the technology that you provide to, to, at the end of the day to your tenants. So thank you all for joining me. I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. What a great session. Thank you, LD, Joanna, Jonathan, and Greg.